All right, <clears throat> lecture 6.2, and I want to pick up just where we left off with 6.1, talking about the limits of our cognitive abilities, and in particular, the limits of our cognitive abilities with reference to the social brain hypothesis. Um, Dunbar and his colleagues have expanded the theory to include the concept of theory of mind. You guys have probably heard of this idea before in some of your other classes, but basically theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states to oneself and to others. What Dunbar and his colleagues have done is found a way to quantify the level of theory of mind that different species and indeed different individuals within a species have. Um, these start out at the most basic level where an animal has no abstract recognition of itself. This is the default operating system for most animals uh, I put sheep, ants, computers for now. These are uh, organisms, or in the case of computers, uh, computers that don't have any awareness that they are an individual being. An ant doesn't need to know that it's an individual being. A sheep is not cognitively sophisticated enough to recognize itself as separate from others. They just do their thing. The next level up is where you have some degree of self-recognition. Now, the way that psychologists measure whether self-recognition is achieved by individual humans as well as other species is most commonly the mirror test. Again, something you may have heard of before. In the mirror test, basically what you do is you take your participant, you put a little mark somewhere on their face, and then you put them in front of the mirror, and you see whether they react to the object in the mirror, the other version of themselves in the mirror, as somebody else, somebody that they should be a little scared of or somebody they're curious about and try to reach to touch the, the person in the mirror or whether they recognize, hey, that's me and this is a different thing about me so I'm going to investigate on myself rather than on the object in the mirror what's going on with this mark. What you tend to see is that most two-year-olds can pass this test though prior to that they can't. You also see that a number of animals can pass this. They've tried this with many, many different animals using all sorts of different creative setups with mirrors. But basically you see that uh, chimpanzees pass this, bonobos pass this, orangutans pass this, gorillas pass this. So basically the great apes, uh, as well as dolphins, orcas, and though there's some debate about this still, uh, elephants. This was a mirror test with a very large mirror and a very large mark. So let's fill out our levels of intentionality uh, table, giving that level, uh, that level one intentionality status to these animals that we've seen. Now, what's interesting about this particular collection of animals is they seem to share certain neuroanatomical features in common. At the broadest level, you can calculate something called the encephalization quotient. This is sort of related to the neocortex that we talked about before, but instead of being the ratio of the neocortical part of the brain to the rest of the brain, it's making some calculation of brain mass to body weight. Of course, as you get bigger and bigger animals, you get a bigger brain, uh, but the blue whale, who has the biggest brain of them all, is not the smartest organism on the planet. As a result, what you want to do is calculate some sort of ratio, and this is the formula that they use to calculate this. What this works out to is a cat being normed at one, uh, and then the rest of the animals have some deviation from that one. You'll see that if you draw this line, and you look at all the organisms which are above this line, you'll see the ones that can pass the mirror test. It seems like there is some level of brain to body ratio that is necessary to have the intelligence to be able to have this level one intentionality of self-recognition. Um, so you see not the horse, it's below the line, but you see the other organisms that we saw on the previous page, they all fall in to this uh, above uh, basically two, and you see the elephants there, they're sort of on the, on the border. But of course, above all, with a, an encephalization quotient well above any of these other organisms is us. Now, looking at the fossil record, we've actually been able to calculate how the encephalization quotient has changed uh, over our recent hominid history. And this is what you see. So here you have millions of years ago, starting from just a little after our deviation from our common ancestor with the chimpanzee. And you have on the y-axis the encephalization quotient. And what you see is there has been this actually uh, pretty sharp increase uh, going from a level of about Two in terms of the encephalization quotient, that is roughly equivalent to what uh, rhesus monkeys and elephants have, 
over the span of four million years, increasing to something approaching six. Uh, that's a staggering increase. And what's interesting is this, just through coincidence, loosely follows the level of intentionality that humans have developed in that time. So let's go back to our table here. Uh, level two, the next stage is not just recognizing yourself, but recognizing that others, other organisms have a mind that's separate from your own. Uh, now that seems pretty straightforward and simple, but that's only because it's so easy for us to do. Uh, it hasn't always been so easy for us to do. Prior to the age of four, you couldn't do this very well yourself. So the way developmental psychologists test this, and again, this might be something that you've learned in a previous class, is the uh, Sally Ann false belief task. And so in this case, you have Sally with her basket, you have Ann who's there observing this uh, with her box. Sally puts a red ball in her basket. Uh, Ann sees that happening. Sally goes out of the room, leaves Ann alone. What Ann does is then she takes the ball from Sally's basket and puts it into her box. Then Sally comes back and wants to play with the ball, where will Sally look for the ball? Now you know what Sally didn't see. You know that the ball has been put in the box. Uh, and so you know where you would look. The critical thing is to recognize that not everybody has the same beliefs as you do. Not everybody has the same mental state as you do. Not everybody saw the same things happen as you do. And uh, do you think that Sally will just look for it where you think it will be? Or does Sally have an entirely different psychological experience, which includes not having seen the ball being moved, and as a result will look for it in her basket? If you answer, it's in the basket, congratulations, you passed the false belief task. You have at least level two intentionality. Children, as I mentioned, can't pass it this, this at three, they can pass it at four. Very few other animals, if any, are able to pass this. This is still a matter of debate. Uh, for most of the time I've been aware of this stuff, it's been assumed that uh, only humans are able to pass this task. Though in 2016, there was this paper published in Science, uh, which is the premier journal uh, of science, and it showed that by observing the eyes of great apes, uh, they s seem to pick up on the false beliefs. It seems like they know where the person is going to look and how that might differ from where they would look themselves, which suggests a recognition of a mental state different from their own. As I said though, this is still a matter of debate. Uh, it's tricky to design these tasks in a way which isolate the ability that we're really interested in when these organisms differ from us on a whole bunch of other features as well. Nevertheless, Let's give it to them. So for this next stage, we will put uh, neurotypical humans uh, and maybe great apes. By the way, the reason I say neurotypical humans is because humans that are far along the autism spectrum uh, who have uh, social cognition deficits actually can't pass this test. But even if uh, most humans can do this, even if maybe the great apes can do this, the levels of intentionality go up even further into the rarefied air where only humans soar. So what is level three? You now are going three levels of intentionality. I know something that you know that she knows. I believe that you think she believes X. One, two, three. Only humans can do this. Uh, and then what's level four? Well, now we're getting into something which is a little bit uh, advanced. Uh, most humans can still do this. Almost all humans can still do this. But this is the necessary level to understand somewhat complex dramas. So Shakespearean plays often involve multiple levels of intentionality. You have to know what one character thinks another character believes about another character's intentions, etc., etc., etc. Game of Thrones is like this. So um, uh, Daenerys is worried that Jon believes that if you were to tell Sansa uh, about his claim to the throne, then uh, she won't tell, uh, uh, what's his name, who will then uh, know and tell uh, whatever. I, it's been a while. Um, but those are multiple levels of intentionality. They require a reasonably advanced theory of mind to understand. It goes up beyond that into the higher levels of theory of mind. Level five, this is where most uh, humans start to fail. Uh, Dunbar has this idea that we like to be pushed to our limits, which is why we find Shakespearean plays, Game of Thrones, these advanced types of narratives exciting to think about. However, he notes that it takes one level beyond the level of intentionality to understand these plays in order to actually write them. And so at level six, this is where only some proportion, 
Dunbar estimates about 20% of the population actually can manage. And so he says that the writers uh, are people who um, are, are, are so sophisticated in their theory of mind, they can adequately manipulate what they want their readers or audience to actually believe in the moment. So they have uh, uh, the exciting level of theory of mind plus one more level on top of that. And uh, you might recognize that at some points you're hitting your own limits of theory of mind. This often happens in terms of uh, relationships. This is a funny cartoon, but there's some truth to it. Of course I care about how you imagined, I thought you perceived, I wanted you to feel. Sometimes you get pushed to your limits in trying to understand the complex dynamics of the levels of intentionality involved. We all know some people who seem to be, uh, have sort of these preternatural abilities uh, of theory of mind, the person who knows everybody, who knows how to manipulate a situation just right, who knows how to say just the right thing uh, in order to uh, navigate an extremely complex social environment. Probably people who are managed to become highly prestigious social leaders are operating on very high levels of theory of mind. Now, there's some interesting modern evidence which actually ties this stuff into uh, something approaching a neat little bow. Uh, this was a paper that came out about 10 years ago. What it showed, and you'll see Dunbar is one of the authors here, what it showed is there's a part of the brain in exactly where you would predict that part of the brain would be, which seems to correlate with our levels of intentionality capabilities. So there's this part of the brain called the orbital prefrontal cortex. Uh, there it is there in pink. As I told my 102 class, if you take your finger, you stick it in your eye, and you start tickling up a bit, you're tickling your orbital prefrontal cortex. What Dunbar and colleagues found was that if you create a um, test of people's level of intentionality abilities, and so what they do is they have various vignettes uh, of social situations, and they'll ask you a bunch of questions. One set of questions tests your just uh, memory for these things, your general um, working memory for understanding all the mechanics of a story. Whereas another set of questions actually uh, tests your ability to understand the complex social relationships, and that's your measure of intentionality. What he finds, whoops, what he finds is that uh, the level at which people fail, that is how high they're able to go in terms of the levels of intentionality before they start failing, directly relates to the size, the volume of that part of the brain. Those individuals who have bigger orbital prefrontal cortices, as, as measured using neuroimaging, also are the people who manage higher levels of intentionality. Uh, so you see that relationship between the volume of this particular part of the brain predicting your social intelligence as measured by this level of intentional competence. A couple of years later, they published, some of the same authors published this, uh, another paper which linked that even further. Not only is it that the uh, size of that part of the brain predicts your level of social intelligence, that ends up predicting the size of your social network. And not, you know, how many Facebook friends you have again, but instead how many people you've interacted with socially over the last week, excluding professional things like if you talk to a doctor or police officer or whatever, how many uh, friends did you interact with? Those people who have larger orbital prefrontal cortices are more socially competent and actually have more friends. So what this evidence shows is that you see the same relationship between individuals within our species as Dunbar was theorizing you saw between different species themselves. Humans underwent a large brain expansion in certain parts of the brain which allowed them to be more socially sophisticated and able to understand higher degrees of theory of mind. And that led to us having these large social groups. That's the social brain hypothesis. And like we talked about last week, this demonstrates again how over the last 1 million, 2 million years, what we were really evolving to, the environment we were really evolving to is the social environment evolving to us.